You're listening to Investify, preaching financial independence and assisting investors to achieve a more flexible and free lifestyle through smart financial planning and real estate investing. If leaving the corporate world and jumping into this thriving industry is what you desire, tune in and listen to stories of like-minded individuals who made the leap to financial independence. Equip yourself with the right tips and tricks to start your real estate journey, making active or passive ventures that are highly profitable and rewarding. What's going on, everybody? You are listening to Investify. My name is Craig Curlop, a.k.a. The Fi Guy, and I'm here with my co-host, Miss Allie Garced. Allie, the agent, how are you doing today? I am excellent. I'm spending some time with family in New York, Westchester County. Feels good to be back with them. Um, yeah, how are you? I'm, I'm doing good, Allie. It looks like you're like uh, in office hours or something. It looks like you're a teacher with that background. <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah, with all these like diploma the things. States, yeah, United States map. You got some diplomas. It's like I'm in a professor's office. Like, yeah. Um, and well, that is the perfect segue because this is a great lesson that we have for the audience today. We interview Jared Sturm. Awesome guy. Has a great story. Articulates it very well. And uh, I'm excited to to see. Actually, we didn't record this part. It was off. It was after we finished recording, but. I want the listeners to like take a look and think as they're listening to this, think about the quote that he told just you and I, Greg, offline that he wants the the listeners to take away that if this guy can do it, if Jared can do it, you guys can do it too, which I thought was like a pretty awesome and very humble um, thing to say. So, yeah, it's really cool because Jared comes from humble beginnings, I think, just like a lot of us. And I'm not saying humble beginnings is like, you know, he was poor living under a bridge, but certainly his trajectory People probably wouldn't have bet on him in high school, right? Didn't do great in school, skipped class, faked his girlfriend's pregnancy, like all the things <laughs> that he had to do in order to like just get like a little bit ahead. And, yeah. you know, now 15 years later, he's absolutely crushing it. And so this is a pretty funny episode. Uh, so make sure to listen all the way to the end. And if you haven't already given us a rating and review, we greatly, greatly appreciate the ratings and reviews. So if you wouldn't mind just hopping on iTunes real quick dropping a set rating and review and sending us a message on Instagram, letting us know that you did it. We always love to get those messages. And so with Absolutely. that being said, let's bring Jared on the show. This episode of Investify was brought to you by the Fi team, a team of investor friendly agents that service all 50 states. If you are looking to house hack, to invest, grow your portfolio, and want a true investor friendly agent on your side, go to the team.com and click get started. And we can't wait to have a good conversation with you. Jared Sturm, welcome to the show, my friend. How you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, uh, Craig, Ali. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Hopefully I can add some value to your guys' audience and uh, share a little bit of my story today. Yeah, man, I hear you're in the dirty South too. Is that right? Well, I'm visiting Atlanta right now, but uh, I live in and operate my business in Cincinnati, Ohio. So the dirty Midwest, I guess. You're the dirty, <laughs> you're, you're from the dirty Midwest, but yeah, in the rusty the Midwest right now, the rusty, yeah, yeah Statlanta, yeah. as some people call it. Um, I don't know. I'm just thinking, I'm just trying to like quote different rap songs right now, but uh, I feel like that's all rap is from me. It's either rap or country in Atlanta, right? Mm, I, don't know, I couldn't tell you. you could t- yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, all right, Jared, um, <laughs> speaking of rap and country, why don't you tell, why don't you take us back to when, everything first started and when you first heard about financial independence. Okay. I, when you said speaking of rap and country, I'm like, Oh no, they're going to ask me to rap or something. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, I mean, if you can, man, if you can here. wrap this interview. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, thanks. Um, but no, taking you back to the beginning, I, I got a, uh, I got an early start towards financial independence and specifically within real estate investment. So I bought my first property, um, which was a house hack. I lived in, one of the bedrooms and rented out uh, four others to friends. And I did that when I was 18 years old. So I closed the closing of that house actually conflicted with my high school graduation. So I was very fortunate to start very, very early. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions on how the heck that happened, but I'll, I'll pass it back to you guys. 
yeah, I guess I'll I'll kind of kick it off with when just give us a little like a sounds like it was May or June of which year did this start and what got you on that track in high school? Yeah, you didn't even have the yeah. the, the hurt of a job yet. <laughs> so I did have the hurt of a job. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, it was June of 2008. Um, and so I graduated high school in 2008, been doing it for 15 years since then. But what got me on that track is my high school um, had a program that it's interesting, but it had a program that if you had a child while you were in high school, you could go work full time. Um, but what I learned um, was they did not verify if you actually had that child. So I signed up for the program, got approved. I didn't have a kid in high school, but I went and I was a full time maintenance tech for another landlord uh, who worked and I worked on his apartment portfolio doing you know, what maintenance techs do. I was the guy plunging toilets, hanging blinds, doing those types of things. And so my whole senior year, you know, I was making, and this was 2007, I was making $15 an hour, living at home, basically zero living expenses and stashing away some savings, which allowed me to have enough to put 5% down on a house when I graduated. And I had at that time, a pretty good skill set of working with my hands and fixing things up. And so I took that house and fixed it up and lived there with, you know, college friends for a little while. Okay. Wow. Like, how did you know? Like this was not available. There was not really any bigger pockets. None of the books had come out yet. So you couldn't have been that smart of an 18 year old. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I've, I've reflected back on this and I don't have a great answer for it because, you know, my, my mom was a stay at home. My parents are great, but my mom was a stay at home mom, and my dad worked uh, as a bookkeeper for 30 years at the same corporation. So entrepreneurship was not in my blood. Real estate investment was not in my blood. No one in my family did it. Um, but what, as I reflect back, why I think I made this path my own is because I was terrible in school. So I'm dyslexic. So reading and writing was never a strong suit of mine, and so I basically did not fit into the standard model of our academic system. And so that meant I didn't fit into the standard model of corporate job and W2 and climb that ladder. And so I was just forced to find an alternative from the very beginning. Wow. So what was your last year in high school? And how did you pitch that program to your parents? I don't remember the conversation with my parents. My parents were always really encouraging of kind of like whatever I needed to do as long as it like I, they, they said like, you know, don't get anyone pregnant, don't go to jail and don't kill yourself. And those were like my boundaries. And uh, other than that, they let me uh, have a lot of control and freedom of my life. Um, how I signed up for it, I don't know. I remember hearing about it. And it's funny because in high school, I dated the same girl all the way through like freshman to senior year. And so I signed up for this program. Everyone's like, uh, she's like right there. What is going on? But they didn't verify it. So I was very happy that I got approved and was able to leave. But my, my senior year was I had to go to, into, into the school for 45 minutes. Um, make sure I was doing like English, I think was the only class I had to take, which for me was typically just going to the wood shop and working on some wood shop project and not going to English and then, uh, leaving and going to work for the rest of the day. Wow. So your whole senior year was just, was, was not really any academics. It was just working for this guy, but you still got all the credits and you were still able to graduate on time. Yeah. Yeah. I graduated. Super, cool. super, super fortunate that our high school had that program because me going to school full-time senior year and taking calculus or something like that would have been like not effective for me. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So that's crazy. So that's wow. a, that's a, obviously a little bit of a unique scenario. And I think a lot of listeners might be past their senior year of high school, but I think that's a crazy, I've never heard of that way to start before. So Jared or Allie, you know what this kind of sounds like we might be getting into here? Yes, I do. This sounds, the... let's see if we actually can be, can be on sync. Here we go. It is the, the real, real deal. 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 Oh, no, bo, bo, bo. <laughs> so awkward. Yeah. Perfect synchrony. Perfect, Perfect synchrony. Yeah. We need to like make a concert of this. Um, all right, Jared, this is the first deal that you ever did intentionally or unintentionally. And it sounds like this one was very intentional, even despite your young age. And so, yeah, tell us a little bit about how you found this one, what the prize was, get spill all the tea if you can, if you can remember. It's been a while. So it's been 15 years. And I would say that first one, there wasn't a lot of sophistication behind it. So you say it, it sounded very intentional. Really, my purchase criteria at that time was I knew I wanted to um, 
work on other work on building a construction company or a renovation company. And so my purchasing criteria for the real estate was a large detached garage. That was basically it. Um, and so I found a house that had a large detached garage that I could start this business out of. And it just happened to have four bedrooms as well. And I said, well, I can generate some income off of that. And I have a lot of friends who are, you know, leaving, leaving the nest and want a place to rent and, um, rough numbers. I think I bought it for 125,000, probably put about 15,000 into it. It wasn't in too rough a shape. And then, um, you know, I was renting by the room for, I think 350 a room. And so it was allowing me to live for free and cash flow a little bit, but really I think the first, what I would label as like true intentional investment property actually came in 2011. And that's when I bought my first dedicated rental property. And I was more intentional about that. And again, this is 2011 Cincinnati, Ohio. So that was, you know, a $40,000 house, uh, decent area, but needed a lot of work. Yeah. So just, just to go back to this first house a bit, it sounds like it was a little bit of a disheveled thing maybe, right? So you, you got your, you had your house, you had your detached unit, you got your renters in, which is amazing, but I suspect you probably didn't have a lease assigned. They were just your buddies. So they were throwing cash under your door or was it like legit and you had leases? No, we didn't have leases. I think at one point later and later on, I ended up implementing leases as I figured things out more. But I would say for the first two years, it was like, hey, pay me, you know, pay me in cash or whatever the agreement was. But it was people that I've known my whole life. And it wasn't like I was out there knowing landlord tenant law or anything like that. Did you ever have any issues come up with that? No. No, nice. fortunately, no. So, um, I mean, it, it definitely taught me how to like navigate relationships and set standards and um, expectations and work hard to make sure those play out. But um, I think it, it was, I was very fortunate to have that beginning and it not have anything go really wrong. And then we started adding single family houses and, um, you know, having true tenants that were not affiliated with me before moving in. And, and I learned my way through that. And I, I don't think we covered this, but it went from single family houses to fourplexes to 10 units. And now we're at about a thousand units in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and so that growth has been great. And I've learned a lot over those 15 years with the foundation of renting to some buddies when I was, you know, just out of high school. All right, Jared. So you said you wanted to buy this home because of your construction company. Did that ever end up going anywhere or what happened with that? It did. So um, when I when I say, uh, I'll say we or are a lot and it's me and my brother. So we still run our company today and we have a third partner as well. But uh, we started that construction company together and we were doing kitchens, bathrooms, additions for, you know, higher end homes. Um, and at that time, what we would do is we would go do a thirty, forty thousand dollar kitchen remodel, um, and this is going to be two thousand eight, nine, ten that time period. We would make you know twenty, thirty thousand dollars, turn around and buy a house with it, and then on nights and weekends we would be in that rental house when we're not working on other people's homes, fixing it up and turning it into a rental. And so the co construction company existed for about three, four years where we were doing some pretty nice renovations to homeowners houses to generate that cash to be able to invest into our rental portfolio before it could support, you know, us doing that full time. Okay. Yeah. And so, okay. Two questions there. You're, you know, you're doing this in 2008, 2009, 2010, you're young, the whole news, everyone is saying that like real estate's a horrible investment and you should stay away. Yet you're still investing in real estate. You're creating a real estate business. You're buying more real estate. So like, how did you mute or block out that noise at that time? I think it's a lot easier to block that out when you're not, when you're not bleeding yourself. So like I was, I was very fortunate to stumble into the real estate market at what seems like the best time possible to do it. Um, but there's a lot of owners who owned, you know, large portfolios that were hurting during that time. I didn't have that hurt to fight through, but I do remember, you know, I remember like my family saying like, Oh, well, you know, uncle Mark had a rental and it didn't go well. Right. Like his, his uh, tenants destroyed it and it was difficult and blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I think it was just because I never really had the, the corporate path in front of me. I was just always good at finding alternative ways to make things work for myself that it, it just kind of bounced off of my shoulders. And I was like, well, this is, this is what I know. I know how to work on houses. So I'm going to put it to use. Um, the noise never really got to me. 
I also presume your communication has to be very strong, especially at such a young age when you're, you know, just out of high school working now in more of a luxury end doing, you know, nicer with your construction company, with you and your brothers doing nicer end homes. How did you get into that? And how we could talk about partnerships a little bit more later, because I presume that you're also in partnerships with their, you know, thousand units. Starting out being in a partnership with your brothers, how did you guys divide up the roles? And how did you end up getting in that sort of luxury type market? So how we got, I'll take how we got into it first is, um, is just word of mouth. And so, you know, I was a maintenance tech when I was in high school, and then I would have a, a friend or family member say, hey, can you fix my bathroom sink? And I would go over there and then they'd say, well, would you be able to remodel the bathroom? And I'd be like, sure. And then I would just watch YouTube and figure it out, right? And I just always said yes to when people would ask me, can you do this? Can you build a deck on the back, back of my house? Of course. And then I would just watch YouTube and figure it out. And I have an, I definitely have a natural ability for the trades. Like I'm just good at working with my hands and it just makes sense to me. Um, and so we just kept saying yes. And that word of mouth kept spreading. And, um, you know, at the time there was a lot of people exiting the construction industry and we were, you know, a couple young guys, but people were saying, Hey, here's some young guys and they'll get the job done and get it done well. And, it just continued to spread and get more and more higher end, higher end, higher end. Um, but we didn't do any marketing or anything like that, or we didn't have a pre-existing relationship that got a foot in the door in that market. Uh, partnering with my brother has always been easy for us. I get this question a lot, like, how do you work with family? Isn't that hard? It never has been hard and it still isn't hard to this day. Um, I think if I have to boil it down to why it works is because I believe his success is more important to me than my own and vice versa. And so no one is keeping track of how much the other person worked. It's just about doing what's needed in the moment. And that, there was less defined roles in the beginning because the organization was so small. Like we were the guys swinging the hammers, pushing the brooms and, you know, doing the billing. And it was just whatever was needed at the moment. We would step up to the plate and get it done. Now we have more defined roles. So in our current company, there's three partners, myself, my brother, and uh, a guy named Coleman. And so our roles are, I take the CEO role, my brother COO, and then our partner Coleman is CFO. I think a better way to describe that is I push the company forward. My brother cleans up the mess that that creates with systems and processes, and then Coleman keeps track of it all. So that's how I like to define our roles within our business. And there's still a little bit of blurred lines, but as the organization grows, they become a little more firm. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool that the like core foundation of the partnership remained the same. You added on another person. So take mm -hmm. us to um, either a deal in between or kind of like where you are now. Uh, what does your portfolio look like? How did you get there? And let's let's dig into another deal, too. OK, yeah, so I mean, it went single families for like duplexes, fourplexes, very organic growth. It was just like a little bit more each time. Right. But it's this, been the same business model even today from that first one. We buy distressed properties and that distress comes in forms of construction or property management because we vertically integrated build our own property management company so whether it was 2008 or 2023 it's the same exact business model and i kind of just stay in my lane on what i know um what we're buying now is 100 plus unit apartment communities in cincinnati ohio those are going to be c to b class assets that have those distressed components of needing to be renovated or needing to be run more effectively. Typically those are going to be in like the 10 to $15 million range with, you know, a couple million dollars in renovation now. And how are you finding them? Uh, well, I haven't found any in nine months. So um, <laughs> the bottleneck in our business right now is quality deal flow. But the, the way I would answer like, how have, how have we found them in the past is any way and every way possible. So like when you get into the larger assets, it's about building relationships with the top brokers in, in the market. Um, and so there's, you know, th three to five in our market that do 80% of the transactions in large apartments. So building strong relationships with them, giving them the confidence that you're someone who will live up to your word and close the deal. But then also other ways like building relationships with owners and uh, any way and every way possible to flip enough rocks to find the next opportunity. 
Yeah, Jerry, I think your your truck here sounds pretty cool where it starts off as a pretty easy, small, single family stuff. And then you, you know, like kind of like you said, you go into duplexes, triplexes, quads, six units, and now you're up to 100 units. I'm just curious. I think a lot of people want to go on a similar track as you, but they may just be in that first or second step. And so I'm curious as to how you went from single families to then having the confidence to buy duplexes or six units. And then, you know, how did that lever up to that? Like, could people just go from single family homes to hundred units or do you recommend kind of that stair stepping process? I think it depends on the person. So like me, I, I didn't have that confidence to make that jump from one house to hundred plus unit communities, but I've seen people do it and they do it well. Uh, I've seen people do it and they fail, right? Like it depends on if you're able to bite off that much, but I think it comes back to your operational ability because it's basically the same exact process, but can you handle a hundred times what, you know, if you, do, if you can do it on a house, can you handle 100 times the, the amount of work? Do you have the, the team in place? And I didn't at the time. So I had to slowly scale that. I don't know what holds people back. And I'm not saying that everyone should go to a thousand units. That's mm -hmm. definitely not what I think, but I think it's just fear or like self doubt because it's really not that different. Like, it's the same exact business model. It's just a high, bigger price tag with more unit numbers in front of it. But we do the same exact thing that we used to do 15 years ago. I see. So it sounds like you probably just had, you, you know, you just gained more confidence as you just acquired more units. And you're like, okay, well, you know, I got 15 units and they may be, you know, single family and duplexes, like a combination of those. Like what's, what's adding another 15 units, right? It's just doubling this thing. We've got the systems in place and, and it sounds like you're extremely systematic dude, which I, which I like. And so how do you, like, how do you grow to a thousand units? Like, you know, there's a lot of things like, how do you raise the capital for it? How do you, how do you, I guess we just talked about finding the deals, but like, how do you find money for it? I can't imagine you're raising all this, you're putting all this in yourself. So the first eight years was a hundred percent just internal capital, um, which was a very slow process. And, and taking it all the way back to that beginning, the first eight houses were a hundred percent cash because again, it was 18, 19, 20 years old. It was 2008, 9, 10, banks weren't lending. And so we had to, no one would give us money. We just had to grind it out, go fix up a kitchen or a bathroom, save that cash, not pay ourselves anything and go buy these little houses that we were going to fix up. And so the first eight were all cash. First eight years, we did all internally um, using our own money and, and stripping the equity out of earlier deal, deals that we had forced our sweat equity into. Uh, and then we would strip it out through a cash out refinance and then go redeploy that into a new project. Uh, about eight years in, we said we really love these large apartment communities. We had done a couple on our own and, and scaled up to several hundred units. And we said, this is this is great. This is where we, we really thrive. But we ran out of money, right? So when things have $10 million price tags, they drain the bank account pretty quick. And so that was when we made the decision to go into the syndication model. And so we, we reached out to people who over the years had expressed interest in investing with us and said, you know, here, here's a project and we outlined it and go through the securities attorneys and draft all the documents we need to then partner with limited partners to participate with us uh, on these projects and take down bigger and bigger um, price tags. I would love to touch more on that. What were some of like the lessons or the hard, you know, hardships that you had going through that process? Well, I would say a big lesson uh, for anyone who is considering it is it's a whole nother business to bolt onto your business. And it's not for everybody. Um, you know, I think when you're raising capital from others, you have to consider what you're doing and your people trade portions of their life to go earn that capital to then come invest it with someone. And you have to treat that capital as sacred as you would a piece of a person's life. And so understanding that responsibility before you go and bolt that additional business model onto your business is really important because there's a lot of people who will throw their hands up if you ask, you know, do you want to raise money in syndications? Oh, yeah. But it's like, that's a really big responsibility and one that I personally avoided for a long time because I was just like, we're not there yet. Um, but I mentioned my third partner that we added on, uh, his name is Coleman. Coleman has his master's degree in accounting. He's a CPA himself. And he worked at huge firms, like multi-billion dollar firms doing their investor reporting to the SEC as well as their investors. And so part of the skill set and the reason for the partnership with Coleman, 
um, was because he could bring that institutional grade background of reporting to the investors into our organization and we could feel more confident making that leap. And so, you know, I'm just, a, you know, kind of the blue collar work boot wearing organic growth background and we needed something else to support that arm of the business and Coleman is absolutely that and has done a great job of making sure we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's on that arm of the business. You know, I think I think it's cool how you went like I keep saying how cool it is that you went from this like starting this process, but I think one reason why you've probably been quite for, not even fortunate, but you've been what's the word? Like good, I guess, at raising capital and, and actually being able to take down some of these deals is that you've got a 10 year, you know, when you started syndications, you've got a 10 year track record and you're like 28 years old, right? And so not many 28 year olds have a 10 year track record of investing in real estate and saying, Hey, like I know the construction, um, you know, I know how to build the systems. We've built this property management company. Like, like you've got so much control. I think people would probably feel comfortable giving you money because you're not worried about having a crappy property manager. You're not worried about having cop crappy contractors. Those are like the two biggest things that destroy deals. And you've got basically both of them in-house. Maybe not your contracting probably isn't in-house anymore, but at least you know what to look for because you've done it yourself. And so just like as someone that is an LP that does look at deals, I'm kind of like, oh, okay, like this guy might, it might make sense to invest with this guy. And so have yeah, you like leveraged I've, that? Oh yeah, for sure. And I think um, if you have no experience in my opinion, you have no business raising capital. And so um, I think you, ha you have to stick your own neck out there first. And to that point, not only did I have 10 years of experience, I had a decent amount of cash myself to then invest right alongside. So like first and foremost, I am an owner operator of multifamily. And then I use syndication to further that business where if you're, if you're investing passively, you've probably seen this, there are other organizations and there's no, this isn't right or wrong, but it's just a reality. There's others that their core competency is raising capital and marketing, right? But they just choose real estate to deploy that core competency into. And so I think you have to make that distinction as a limited partner of like, what are you looking for, right? And for us, it's just, that's something we certainly have leveraged is we're, putting tons of our own cash into every single project that we do, because ultimately that's what our core competency is, is being that owner operator. I think that for lack of a better term is put your money where your mouth is. Totally. Totally. And then yeah. you must've hired, you must've hired the CFO because you know, people didn't want someone that was dyslexic running numbers for him. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think, um, I think the feedback I've gotten from investors over the years is, they see like the opportunities are either you have the the boots on the ground, the blue collar guys who can force the appreciation and really uh, operate well. But then a lot of times you'll get a Microsoft Word document as an investor that says, we did good, here's your check, right? Or you have this huge institutional grade capital raising machine that produces great financial reports and things, but they kind of lose the ability to be nimble and force that appreciation. And so in my very biased opinion, uh, the feedback that I've gotten over the years is SNS Capital Group, our company is kind of the best of both worlds where we're geographically staying very focused, but we have a, uh, that institutional grade background of accounting and reporting to translate that information of the results back to the investors. Yeah. And it sounds like you're staying very, uh, like you don't have any fat in your company. You've got three people, you've got a thousand units. You know, it's, the roles are pretty clear. I know you said there were some blurred lines, but at least the way you describe it to me, like I could clearly know who to go to for which thing. We hope this episode is inspiring you to take action. If you're thinking about becoming a real estate agent or an agent who wants to join an investor-friendly team, just hit me up on Instagram at the Fi Guy because we are growing our team in Denver, Seattle, San Diego, and Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, but also adding to our network in all 50 states. And if you didn't already know this, the FI team provides a super supportive environment with one-on-one -on -one coaching, accountability, and ongoing training to help develop kick-ass, rock star, investor-friendly real estate agents. So hit me on, up on Instagram, at the FI guy, shoot me a DM, and we'll set up a time to chat. Can't wait to chat with you. You know, you mentioned that you, you've, you've gone nine months without doing a deal, and I think Mm -hmm. Even in the past couple of years, maybe maybe I'm just meeting more people in the syndication space, but it feels like 
a couple of years ago to even like maybe about six months ago, everyone and their mother was getting into syndications because it was like the sexy buzzword. And so have you seen any shift in the market during that time in terms of like, well, people are just bidding deals up just to get deals. There's a lot of unsophisticated investors taking down these syndications, which are diluting any deals that are any good. Have you noticed that? You mean in the last, say, call it nine months? Like, I feel like I've, I've seen less of it in the past six months, like since interest rates were, have mm-hmm. risen. But when interest rates were low, like in, you know, 2021, early 2022, I feel like everyone was trying to get into syndications and everyone was trying to raise capital. And I haven't heard as much about it recently. Maybe I'm just out of it now. But is is there like, was there a time where it's like so hard to find a deal because there's just so many unsophisticated people in the market paying way over price? Or did you not see? Yeah, that? for sure. I mean, that's just part of the real estate cycle, I think. Um mm-hmm. And, and I don't even know if you can point the finger all that new unsophisticated syndicators. There's just sometimes over aggressive people who just think the party will continue forever. Right. But maybe they've been in the industry for a long time. Cincinnati, Ohio is a market that is kind of like in the when when Arizona and Texas and Florida are doing what they've done over the last decade. People look at Cincinnati and they call it a stagnant market. Right. Uh, but as Arizona and Florida and Texas start to come back down, they'll look at Cincinnati, Ohio as a stable market. And the reason I say that is because, to your point, we don't get as much volatility in transactions or pricing. And so we don't see like the aggressive nature that maybe you're alluding to uh, that you've seen in, in 2000 or 2020, 2021, when everyone was syndicating. I think what those new people or unsophisticated syndicators would do is they would lean on the back of the market more than their own track record or core competency. And so they would say, look at Arizona, look at the numbers of Phoenix, right? Um, Let me go raise money where I'm just like, well, just look at what I did. This is, this is my business. This is how I operate. It's Cincinnati, Ohio. It's a, it's a different um, sales approach. And so we didn't see as much of that bid up process because of new syndicators. I'm sure also having a a really strong relationship with a broker, like you mentioned before, you know, having a good, good broker or a couple of brokers that you work with to be able to help Mm -hmm. like bring deals your way. I'm sure that also helped as well. Can you talk a little bit more about how to even start a relationship with a broker for those that might not have one already or might not even know where to look like the very beginning? How should that relationship look like? Authentic. So like always being honest, I, I'm not a huge fan of like the fake it till you make it model. Um, so like I'll tell my true story. This is the exact amount of units we own. You know, I'm the I'm the blue collar, blue boot jean or blue jean boot wearing person. This is my background. This is what I'm good at. This is what I'm looking for. And just figuring out how you how you can add value. I will say like I I did try to translate my deal sourcing abilities from single families or small multifamilies into the larger assets. And it didn't translate that well. And the reason being is because the opportunity to make money as a broker in, you know, $10 million properties is significantly more. And the, the relationship building that the brokers work on their end is, you know, 30 years in the making with, a a whole team and more sophistication. So there's just those top five brokers that you want to build relationships with. And it's less about, you know, that direct to the owner relationship that you might see in single families. So what I, what I realized was my time is better spent really building strong, authentic relationships with the top five brokers, let them do their job and they'll bring me the opportunities rather than try to like cut in front of them because they got 30 years of, of hard work and, uh, better systems in place than I'm willing to do on my deal sourcing. So working with them and understanding that they're just better at that job and let them do their job. And how can you tell that they are better? You know, what are some like qualifying questions that someone who has some, you know, an investor that might have already some experience, what are some questions that you have asked your brokers or others can ask other brokers to make sure that the, that the relationship is going to be beneficial? So I'm, primarily on the buy side right now. I'm not doing a lot of selling. And so I'm just looking for the brokers who do a lot of selling. And so that's pretty easy to look up, you know, who are in your market, who are your top 
brokers in the, in the niche of real estate that you focus in. So I'm looking at in Cincinnati, Ohio, who sold the most uh, multifamily assets that I like to buy over the last five years. Let's go make sure we build true, authentic relationships with them. And so a lot of them are about my age. So I'll just, you know, I even have like this, this week, I have a, a play date at the park with me and another broker and his kids. Right. So it's just like, it doesn't have to be like this super sophisticated thing. It's just like, get to know them, uh, explain my story, be a good buyer, live up to the things you say you're going to do, understand their perspective of they only make money when the deal closes. So figure out how to get it there as easy as possible. Vetting them is more about like, uh, you know, vetting them is about, do they sell a lot of real estate and then understanding what type of relationship you want to have with them. So it's not like, it's not like all of them. I'm like, let's go to the park together. Right. I have certain ones that you just, you fit together more with, but another one, I, he was a a quarterback in college. And so I, I flew him and I down to Tampa to watch the Cincinnati Bengals and Tampa Bay Buccaneers to watch Brady and Burrow play. And just like those types of things will stand out and you just build rapport and, you get the phone call, you get that one chance, that one phone call a couple days before it goes on the market, it gives you the head start and you try to get it done. Yeah, I think, I think the answer here is there's not really a shortcut to building relationships. You have to just like systematically, you know, like, have you ever read the book, The Like Switch? Mm-hmm. It's a really no. good book. Uh, it's a really good book about building relationships. And one of the things that the guy talks about is, you know, frequency is a big part of building relationships. And so you know, it's, it's frequency and intensity is another one. And so by doing a trip to Tampa, it's intense because you're spending a lot of time with that person. Mm-hmm. And if you're also going to the park with them every other weekend and doing stuff like that, you've got that frequency. And so that's how you build relationships. But it takes time is the main factor in just actually mm-hmm. building that relationship and just kind of following up. And so, uh, Jared, it sounds like you've done a great job at that. Uh, and so I, I do want to transition a little bit into, so we kind of understand how to find the deals. It's established relationships with brokers. How are you underwriting these deals? How do you run these numbers? Um, what do you mean by that? So how can you tell, so, so a, a broker gives you a deal. How can you tell if it's a good deal or a bad deal? Do you have any rules of thumb? Do you have any ways? I mean, I'm sure there's like a big analysis spreadsheet that you're running through once something passes your rule of thumb, but why don't you just start with the rules of thumb? Yeah, so um, we do have our analysis spreadsheet, and I would say each of those line items in the analysis spreadsheet goes back to our years of experience. And so knowing exactly what payroll is going to cost or how much it's going to cost to renovate this unit or how all of the income or expense line items in that analysis analysis sheet and underwriting goes back to how confident are you are, are you in that guess um, and years of experience help you fill in those numbers. Uh, rules of thumbs that we're looking for as far as metrics go, cash on cash returns, we're going to be trying to hit like an 8 to 12 percent. Uh, IRR is usually going to be 12 to 15, somewhere in there, but it's going to depend on the business model. So typically what we're doing is long term buy and hold. And what I mean by that is about 10 years. Um, but a lot of them are going to be value add. So we'll fortunately, because of the market and our in our core competency, we've been able to typically buy and strip the equity out usually within two to three years, a hundred percent of that equity then gets returned to investors. Um, and so we're looking for those metrics, uh, kind of our buy box, if that's where you're going is C to B class assets, a hundred units or more in Cincinnati, Ohio with a uh, potential for that value add upside. Cause I got the, I got a question, um, at another place I was speaking last night, you know, like what your cap rate targets are. And for us, our business model is, is heavy value adds. And so the best projects I buy are negative cap rates when I buy them. Right. So last year, the, the last big project I bought was a 236 unit foreclosure. A hundred of them were vacant when I bought it. That was bleeding money, right? It was a negative cap rate when we bought that, but it was the, it was a fantastic project now once we've stabilized it and so i threw a lot at you there hopefully i hit what you were asking for as far as like uh metrics that we're looking for in underwriting uh yeah i I understand um and i think like i guess i want to just maybe dive in a little bit about like kind of what those different terms mean if people are kind of just getting into this multifamily thing so what's the difference between like a cash on cash return versus an irr 
as well as you know what would a negative a negative cap rate just means it's losing money I would say most people are familiar with cash on cash return, right? If you gave me a hundred dollars and I give you $10 back, that's a 10% cash on cash return. But IRR is kind of a, a little bit more sophisticated modeling where it takes into account the time value of money. So if I said to you, if you gave me a hundred dollars and I said, okay, I'll give you $10 back, but would you like that $10 today or 10 years from now? Your answer is always going to be, I'll take that $10 today so I can go redeploy it or use it. And that's kind of how I view IRR in a, in a simplistic way is it takes into account the fact that every investor would want their money back faster and it calculates the time value of that money. Um, you, you, in my opinion, outlined negative cap rate fine. So I don't think that needs more explanation, but let me know if you want me to go into it. Okay. No, I think that, I think that all sounds good. Um, I think, um, I guess one other, so I think, there seems to be like, you know, when you're, when you're analyzing a, a single family property, it seems like there's a lot less numbers to go in there, right? You already mentioned like, you know, there's payroll, which you don't have to worry about in a single family. Um, yeah. Maybe there's like a lot more maintenance, there's common areas, there's, you know, stuff that like you've got to really maintain as a, and so like, it, and I know you probably get historical financials from, you know, from the previous investor and all that. And, but how can you mm -hmm. confirm, how do you confirm that all these numbers are actually true? Right, because I can't imagine you're just going to take their rent roll and, and call it right. No, I mean, usually you take your historical financials and it's a reference, but the whole thing gets rebuilt in your own underwriting model anyway, because you as the buyer are not the seller. And so you want to make sure as the new owner, you're going to be able to operate the way you know you're going to be able to operate. And like I said, track record helps with that. And so when you have a thousand units and you're buying another hundred units, in the same neighborhood, it's pretty easy to then go reference your current financials on all of your properties and say, here's what we run at for, you know, repairs and maintenance and these types of accounts. But ultimately, I think what people need to realize is underwriting is a guess. How good are you at guessing? And so um, you have to really know your stuff to be good at underwriting. And there's variations between every deal. Yes, we have a thousand units that then we can reference off of, but we might say, well, this project has boiler heat rather than um, individual heating system. How is that going to impact the utility bills? And just taking the time to work through each account and make your best guess from both a logical perspective and sometimes a, just a projecting out there. Um, it sounds like super sophisticated, but if you could, you could just do it on a piece of loose leaf paper where you're saying, well, how much money is coming in, rents, other income, all these things, how much money is going out, what's your NOI, you know, it, it, uh, I think some people get too afraid of the analysis. And especially if you're talking about a single family house, it, it doesn't need to be that super complicated with some like super sophisticated underwriting spreadsheet like my CFO has built, right? Uh, it doesn't need to be that in the beginning. And it certainly wasn't that for us. Right, right. And I think that's why, you know, it makes sense to start small, do that staircase. And as you start mm -hmm. to get bigger, you start to adapt your spreadsheet, you start to adapt your, really just your mindset too. Um, and you just kind of keep growing. Uh, Jared, so, I mean, you went from 18 years old, one unit, four how four, four, Renting out to your buddies. Now you've got thousands of units in Cincinnati, Ohio. What does you know, forty-three year old Jared look like? Where are you going? Where are you going next? Yeah, I I think about that a lot. Um, I'm not one who has set a specific target of like you know, ten thousand units or this much revenue growth per year. I think those are great, and I understand why companies do that for sure. But I also think it directs you to make acquisitions at potentially a pace that is not correct for what the market is giving you. So how I guide our company is always like, we're going to execute on opportunities when they meet our criteria. And here's all the things we're going to do to put ourselves in front of those opportunities. And if none come up, none come up. And I'm okay with that. With that being said, I'm someone who's highly motivated by progress. Like I just like progressing through life and what what I've been learning over this last year, especially with no acquisitions happening, is that progress can come in other facets of life. So obviously part of my identity is entrepreneur, real estate investor, things like that, but I'm also a father, a husband. And so I'm 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 scratching that fulfillment itch of progress in other avenues of my life. Health, well being, fatherhood, husband, 
those types of things is where I'm really pushing myself over the last year. And so what does 43 year old Jared look like? Hopefully just a better version of myself today. And, mm. and we'll have to see what components allows me to do that over the next decade. Jared. So, you know, one thing that I've been thinking about is that, like we said, a lot of people have been getting into the syndication space in 2020, 2021, and they have these three to five year time time frames. And you know they're buying these deals at really low interest rates, so it works. But as interest rates have risen, and we don't know what the, the conditions of the market will look like in now one to three years from when they purchased the property, how do you think that some of these, you think there's going to be potentially like a, some discounted deals coming because people aren't going to be able to offload these properties or what do you think is what's your view on that? I think so. Um, and I would say my, my perspective on this has changed over the past month or so. And the reason I say that is because again, I'm in the Cincinnati, Ohio market. That market is known for consistent, predictable cash flow, and deals were never as tight from an underwriting perspective as some other markets. And so what I think happened in the last, two, three years is we had people buying with floating rate debt uh, because they needed that lo slightly lower interest rate to make the deal pencil to hit the return, even with their aggressive underwriting. And so what I see happening is in the more competitive markets, call it the Southeast or, um, you know, everybody knows which markets I'm talking about, coastal markets, um, where everyone had to get more aggressive, put floating rate debt and maybe are not leaning on operations as heavily. I definitely think there will be some some challenges for people and some more opportunities to buy in those markets. Cincinnati, Ohio, I think there'll be less of that. There'll be some of it, but there's also still a ton of capital on the sideline kind of positioned and ready to sweep those up. So I don't know how much we're going to see as far as like a supply and demand imbalance like we saw in 2008, 9, 10. There's still a lot of cash sitting there waiting for those people who made a mistake. But, you know, fear is a powerful thing in the in investment philosophy. And so we'll wait and see how much fear comes into the market. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of floating rate loans. I have one investor who is very high up in uh, one of the crowdfunding platforms. And he had shared with me that about 30% of the syndications that he sees, which is over a thousand syndications, are struggling to service their debt right now um, because of the interest rates have moved on them and they were already too thin on their debt service coverage ratio. So I think that's going to cause problems, but we'll see how it plays out. Hopefully, hopefully that answers yeah, your question. Yeah, that's super helpful, man. Thank you. Nice. Love that. Awesome. Well, Ali, you know what time it is? I know what time it is. It's time for, time for the, the final, final, the final four. four. All right, that was Jared. The best we've been, done so far. I know this Perfect. is the history, history in the making here. Uh, Ellie, why don't you kick us off the final four? Yeah. What are you currently reading? Okay. Um, so I do a lot of audiobooks and a lot of podcasts as well. So that back to the beginning of the podcast, dyslexia doesn't have me reading a lot. So but my listening comprehension is very good. And so I can turn audible to two and a half speed and eat through a book and, and actually comprehend quite a bit of it. So speaking of the progress and other facets of my life, the books that I'm listening to right now are Breath, which is by James Nestor. It's about like the science of breathing, kind of like meditation, mindfulness, things like that. Um, and I really have enjoyed that. Um, and then another book, by Matt Walker called Why We Sleep. And so one of the things mm -hmm. I'm trying to progress on from health and wellness is my sleep. And I've always had good sleep, but I'm like, I could be better. And so you can tell by those books, I'm really like progressing in other avenues of my life or other buckets outside of real estate and entrepreneurship. Do you, do you tape your mouth when you sleep? I do. Yeah. Same. <laughs> Dude, it's game changing. Isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it game changing? Really? Craig, are Wait, you how does Craig, that... are you married? I am married, yeah. <laughs> okay. So I started doing it after I read the book, but I didn't tell my wife. And then like one night she looked over and was like, What? <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? And it's like, 
Uh, well, I'm trying this new thing, but no, yeah. What Ali, what Craig's saying is in this book, they say basically breathing through your nostrils is way better for you than breathing through your mouth. But subconsciously, when we're asleep, sometimes you breathe through your your mouth. And so to stop that, you can put like a little bit of surgical tape on your mouth and, you know, freak your significant other out when they look over at you in bed. So. Yeah, it's a, I, we, we went so far to do the hostage tape. I don't know if you've seen that, but it like covers your whole mouth and I've got a mustache. So it's hard for like that surgical tape to work for me, but the hostage yeah. tape is legit. And it yeah. is like, I wake up, my mouth's never dry. Nose is fully clear. I get a great night's sleep. It's good for your immune system and your heart. Like there's so many benefits. So mm-hmm. you got to try it, Allie. It's, it's a, it's a game changer. What book was this in? Was this yeah. in the sleep book or the breathing book? Breath. Breath. Okay. Yeah, that's breath. why. Because I, I read the it's sleep. Really I was like, I must book. have missed that. Nice. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a good one. All right, Jared. So second question is, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh, I've gotten so much help over the years and had great people in my life to give me lots of different advice. Um, probably it's, it's not the mistakes you make, but it's how you react to them. I've also gotten a similar question of like, uh, you know, how often do you fail? And my answer is like, I don't know. I'm just not good at framing failure in a negative way because it's not the mistakes you make. It's how you react to them. And so I mess up all the time, but I just try to limit those mistakes to the degree that they're easy to come back from and not let them be ones that I can't bounce back from. And so I'm sure lots of people have told me different variations of that same lesson, but I specifically remember my woodworking teacher in high school telling me that. And it would be like, you know, it'd be related to some woodworking project, but obviously he was trying to uh, teach a a deeper lesson. It's not about the mistakes you make if you cut a board wrong or something like that. It's about how you come back from them, how you make that project look good, even if you did something incorrectly. And, um, yeah, I, I try to do that in a lot of facets of life, limit failures to a certain extent. Sounds like your woodworking shop was way better than any sort of English class where you would be <laughs> reading like To Kill a Mockingbird or something like, yeah, yeah. and I don't, I don't really remember, remember much of To Kill a Mockingbird, but that lesson that you got from your woodworking class, it means it was worth yeah. it for you to skip English. Yeah, he was like 42 years into teaching so you can imagine this like old school wood shop teacher that is just like he was he was a perfect fit for someone like me who did not want to be in school but just made me stay in line and let me uh, work on some things that I was really interested in that's awesome number question number three you've already spoken and touched on a little bit being um, a father now, an actual father, not no longer a fake one <laughs> and being a <laughs> husband. <laughs> uh, yeah. so overall, if you could elaborate more specific on what is your why? It's my why. Okay. So, um, you're, you're queuing me up to say it's my kids, but I think my, uh, my why has evolved a lot over the years. And so we talked about the last 15 years of my life or more and it, and it definitely has evolved. And so it used to be to put food on my plate, you know, like I, that was the main priority. And then it turned into, to build a foundation to then build a family on. Uh, and then when that was achieved, it was, it was like, okay, that's checked off. I, you know, I have a roof over my head. I have food in the fridge. I, I have a foundation where I can with confidence, get married and start planning for kids and check when that's done. It became more about financial freedom and independence. And, and then truly when that was met, um, I said, okay, well, what's next, right? The hierarchy of needs started to come out and it says, okay, well, what, what does self fulfillment look like? And it's, how can I help others? And, and really that was one of the impetus that made me transition into the syndication model that I wanted to avoid for a long time, because I saw the responsibility of it. And when I talked about the the weight of that responsibility, I, I knew that weight of that responsibility even when I was 21 years old and I didn't want to do it. But once I had met my other whys in my progress, I started thinking like, I can use this thing that I'm good at to help other people. And so in hindsight, I've, I've watched people retire from their jobs because of the investments they've made with us. And that's very impactful. And so my why is like, has transitioned in the hierarchy of needs and more about helping others at this point. And how can I use the skill sets that I have to be of value to others in 
my network and in society and those types of things. So yeah, I hope, hopefully that answers your question. Right now it's hard to pin down exactly, but um, definitely giving back. Yeah, love that. Nice. All right, man, last question. What are some fun and interesting alternatives to war that countries could settle their differences with? Uh, political questions here? Um, Maybe this is better for <laughs> Ali or, or Ali's dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got war strategy going on behind you here. Um, yeah, we can ignore that. I don't know how to blur could, my background. <laughs> I don't know. Like, uh, I think that the world is highly incentivized by money, whatever currency that is in. And so if we could settle things up by having a more universal currency, we might be able to avoid death and violence. But how you do that is way beyond my knowledge or skill set. So I think a lot of it, a lot of conflict boils down to money. If we could have a better way to have a universal currency, we might be able to avoid some of that conflict. There we Take go, it to man. the White House, see new, what happens. New, new world order right there. Jared, 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 Jared coming right at you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. All right, Jared, where can people find out more about you um, if they want to learn more about your story, syndications, perhaps if they want to invest in SNS? Yeah, I think the best uh, best start would be to go to snscapitalgroup.com. So that's three letters like Sam, Nancy, Sam, capitalgroup.com. That's our website. And there's lots of ways within that website to get in touch with me. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Uh, well, uh, well, said Sam. Jared. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, and yeah, but it was, it was awesome to hear your story and get to know you a little bit better. Uh, super inspiring for a lot of people out there to kind of start small, but in 10 or 15 years, you know, they can be owning thousands of units if that's so there is, to, if that so is their desire. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah, man, thanks so much for coming on and we'll, uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And that was Jared Sturm. Ali, what did you think about Jared? That was an awesome show. He seems like he, I mean, he's been in it for a while. You know, he's been in the real estate quote unquote game for 15 years at the age, starting at the age of 18, going up all the way to where he is now. That's like, what an accomplishment. Yeah, I think it's crazy. I think like just, man, it, it seems crazy that he kind of knew to house hack before at 18, <laughs> before anyone knew to house hack, like he knew he could buy a 5% down house. He knew to rent out the rooms, albeit it may not have been like efficient. He didn't run any numbers on it, but still just the fact that he was able to do that and know that at that age, like at 18, like the only thing I was thinking about was like college and oh, like yeah. girls and like, that's it. Yeah. Me too. And so like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also girls. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, like, I don't know what, um, so I don't know like what got into his brain and I don't think he even knows what got into his brain, but just showing that you can take action and you kind of just like figure it out on the way and don't rush. That's another thing is he seems like a very patient man and he just like system. His first eight deals were all cash. And then for the next eight years, he did not use partners and then he went ahead and used partners. Right. And so like, remember guys, like life is not necessarily a sprint. It can kind of just be like a, a slow jog and you'll still get to your destination in a much safer, easier way. And so, yeah, I think that's all I got to say about Jared Alley. Anything you want to add? Yeah, he also added again at the, at the end after we stopped recording that the most powerful tool in real estate is time. So going back to how patient he is, that has helped him a lot too. Knowing that real estate is the long game going, you know, even if you think you are you might not be progressing, little by little will compound. Absolutely. It's just like the, you know, Darren Hardy's 1%. Is it Darren Hardy's 1% rule or the compound effect? Yeah. When he talks about the 1% rule, probably it's the same thing, right? Just get like yeah. 1% better every day. And by the end of the year, you'll be 37 times better than you were at the beginning of the year. If you just do 1% every day, it's, it's profound how the compounding works. And if you get 1% worse per day, I don't know how that math, math works out, but you'll probably end up being negative to what you were. And so a total criminal, something bad, <laughs> total criminal, something bad. Yeah. Maybe you'll fake your girlfriend's pregnancy and then do all, he'll do all the things that his parents said not to do. Get a girl pregnant, kill somebody and then go to jail. So, yeah. um, <laughs> um, awesome. Well, Hey guys, thanks so much for listening to this week's episode. I hope you're getting some enjoy enjoyment out of it and hope get some education out of it. We are obviously dropping episodes every week. We also try to do Instagram lives when this drops that same afternoon. So make sure to check those out. 
And if you haven't already, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes and shoot us a follow on the Fi Guy on Instagram. And Allie is Allie the Agent, Allie A L I underscores in between. There you go, Allie. Great to talk to you as always. And until next time, I'll see you later. I'll see you later, Craig. That's it for this episode of Investify. We hope that these nuggets of real estate wisdom lead to more savvy financial planning and a clearer path towards financial freedom. For more content like this, subscribe to the show at investify.com. Don't forget to leave a rating and share it with your friends. Together, we can transform more real estate newbies into successful and clever investors. Thank you so much for listening. See you on the next one.